continue with our series on our vision statement. Uh, we are a community of servants called by God's reconciling grace to open doors of sanctuary, to create new avenues of ministry, to equip Christians for discipleship, and to lead reconciling ministries. It's in your bullets and it's on your announcement sheet. By the end, we're all going to say it in unison and know it. You know, maybe we'll do it even as a responsive reading, but you'll know it. Um, last week was... We are a community of servants. This week is called by God's reconciling grace. This is uh, called by God's reconciling grace is the why of the vision statement. We are a community of servants. Why? Because we're called by God's reconciling grace, which is, as Gwen said in the children's story, is something that's freely given to us for which we're grateful. And then we engage in ministry of opening doors of sanctuary and, and uh, creating new avenues for ministry. Why? Because we are call, uh, called by God's reconciling grace. We are called to this ministry. Now usually when we think of being called, we usually talk about it in terms of called to the ordained ministry. And that's right, but but we can be called to lots of things. We can be called to our professions. Uh, we, can be, we can be called to jobs and, and responsibilities in the church or in the community. We can feel that we are picked, chosen um, for anything special. So uh, we can be called to a wide variety of things. Now, when, when Paul talks about being called to ministry... In, in 2 Corinthians, he, he says, and it, it's always translated this way, having this ministry by the mercy of God. How that reads is we are mercied into ministry. Paul uses mercy as a verb. I don't think we've ever used in English mercy as a verb. But for Paul, it's we are mercied into ministry. And I love how that phrase is. You know, mercy is a verb. We are mercied into ministry. Think of the times that you're, you're not mercied into something. You're, you're bullied into something or coerced into something. Somebody holds a gu gun to your head or gives you a guilt trip so you do something. Paul's talking about the opposite of that, being mercied into ministry. You know, the, it, it's a warm, it's a warm connotation to be mercied uh, by a teacher, by a, by a friend, by a lawyer, by a neighbor, by a pastor, by a church member, to be mercied. You know, it's like we're being formed and shaped. Uh, we're being mentored. It's a hands-on thing. We're being, we're being kind of sculpted and, and massaged into being a new person. It's, uh, it, it's like we're being created. Yeah. When we are mercied, we're mentored, we're cared for, we're forgiven, we're reconciled. We are recreated and made into new people and given a, a fresh start and a new life. It's a wonderful thing to be mercied into life. I asked uh, one of our members if they'd ever been mercied. And he told this story of being very, very destructively addicted to alcohol. And he said, you know, I, I always thought I'd be dead by my 30th birthday. And then when I reached 40, I thought I'd be dead before my 40th birthday. And here I am approaching 50. And I've been mercied into a new life. I've been mercied by AA. I've been two years sober. I've been mercied by King Avenue. I've been at King Avenue two years. He said, in a sense, I was dead 
by the time I was almost 50. Because of being mercied, I died to my addictions. And I was mercied into new life. What a wonderful story for a person to tell. Have you ever had something horrible happen, something that's a disaster to you, where you're just miserable? Some of us have have gone on family trips with our children, where the kids are throwing up in the car. And you get lost and can't find out where you are and your phone's died. And you get a flat tire. And then you wait forever for the tow truck. And you think, this is the worst trip ever. This is no good. Life stinks. And then years later, you tell that story at a dinner, at a party. And the worst parts of the story are the parts you have to tell. Because now they're the powerful part of the story. And that miserable part of your life that you didn't think you were going to survive, you see in a new light. And you've been mercied to see it in a new light. When I was in high school, I was a phenomenally adequate basketball player. And there was a stretch my junior year, it's about a month, where I I really was good. And our team was good. And we won all the games that month. And we we went into the, the game against Dayton Dunbar, which was always a good team. And, I, you know, I would I got my name in the newspaper before that game, and, and local radio put that game on the radio. Um, it was, you know, it was kind of a neat thing. We went to Dunbar and played that game, and a sports writer would say that basically this player from Dunbar undressed me. He stole the ball from me three times in six seconds. <laughs> you know, it's really a physical achievement. See, you're laughing. You're laughing. And the third time, he, each time he stole it from me, he laid it in and scored two points. And the third time before he shot, he turned and laughed at me. He scored six points in five seconds. Had he not laughed, it would have been even shorter. I was humiliated. I've never been so embarrassed, so ashamed, wanted to hide. I didn't want to leave my house. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to go to practice. I felt everyone was looking at me. It was an awful moment in my life. My mother said to me after that game, she said, oh, get over it. Ten years from now, nobody will remember that. At my tenth year reunion, First thing somebody said to me when I walked in, (laughs) Keeney, do you remember the Dunbar game? And we sat, and we remembered that story, 
and the worst parts became the most powerful parts. And we laughed at it just like you're laughing now. <laughs> because I'd been mercied. I'd been given a new light by the God who said, let light shine in the darkness. And my life was darkness at that point. But the light shone in my life, and I could see it differently. I could be defeated but not crushed. I could be perplexed but not driven to despair. I could be forsaken but not desperate. God takes the pieces, the messes, the fractured parts of our lives and mercies them to bring life out of death. We are given this treasure in our clay jars. We are mercied. God does this all the time in the Bible. God mercies Moses who fled because he killed somebody into a new life. God mercies Jacob who's afraid to go back to his brother and he's mercied into this new life. He dies to the old life and comes alive. God mercy, Jesus mercies Zacchaeus from his life as a swindler to a new life. God mercies Mary Magdalene into a new life. The call of the disciples in Matthew is Jesus mercying them into a new life. Here's how it worked then for a young man. You finished your formal schooling at 13 or 14. And if you wanted to continue your schooling, you would apply to a rabbi to be taught by this rabbi. And you'd go to the rabbi and be interviewed by the rabbi. And what the rabbi would be looking for is, does this person have the intelligence to learn what I'm teaching? And does this person have the ability to follow me, to actually do what I do? And can this person be like me? And if they had all that, the rabbi would pick them and they would further their learning. If they were not determined to be capable of learning or being like the rabbi, the rabbi would say, thank you, but I'm not picking you. You can go back to the family business. They were, in essence, rejected. Peter and Andrew and James and John are at the family business fishing because they were not chosen. They were not called. They were not seen as capable of following a rabbi or being like a rabbi. That Jesus comes and calls them is extraordinary. We might hear that story that immediately they followed Jesus. That's not the surprise in the story. The surprise in the story is that the rabbi comes to them and says, I'm choosing you. I'm calling you. I think you can do it. That's the wonder of this story. Jesus is mercying them and giving them a new way of seeing their life, a new start, a fresh beginning. He's reconciling with them. 
Jesus is saying, follow me. You can be like me, and you can do what I do. Nobody else said that to them. Nobody that thought that highly of them. You know, when Jesus gets frustrated with the, with the disciples, and we know in the Bible how often he gets frustrated, it isn't because they can't do what he does. It's because he knows that they can do it. Have you ever been mercied? Has somebody ever given you a fresh start and a new life or mentored you? Has anybody ever blessed you with forgiveness? We are a community of servants called by God's reconciling grace. We are a community of servants mercied into following Jesus in ministry so that we mercy others by opening doors of sanctuary to them, by creating new avenues of ministry for them, for equipping Christians for discipleship and leading reconciling ministries. And the thing is that in calling us and mercying us, Jesus believes we can do it. May it be so. Amen.